Hello everyone, live here in the room and on live stream around Google. Carrie Byron is no stranger to fans of her multiple reality-based science-oriented television shows from Discovery Channel's Mythbusters to Netflix's White Rabbit Project to the Travel Channel's Thrill Factor and many other programs. Carrie is also no stranger to Google. I had the privilege of interviewing her for Toxic Google a couple of years ago and she co-hosted the Google Science Fair with YouTuber Simone Yetch. And Carrie just joined STEM toy company Smart Girls as their chief creative officer, as though she hasn't had done enough amazing things. So today we're welcoming Carrie back to Google to talk about her autobiographical first book, The Crash Test Girl, which applies the scientific method to the ups, downs, and in-betweens of life. Please welcome Carrie to Google. I like how you introduced that as her first book as if like there's going to be so many more after uh, Well, this. I hope there are because your book is awesome. So I had a chance to learn a new word, galley copy, which is something I had to Google. Uh, it's a, a pre-release copy of the book before it's totally done. I and had to Google uh, it too. I didn't know <laughs> I no what they were talking means. about. I, I, I didn't want to ask the publicist what's a galley copy because I'd feel like uh, I should know that. So. so you didn't just write this book. You created some amazing sketches and we're going to show some of those in a little bit and illustrations to complement the text. Walk me through how you created the opportunity to write the book, not just the book itself, but how you actually made that opportunity happen and the process of writing a first book. I would like it to be something very grand, but uh, so I was in a bar in Iowa and I was sitting around with this random group of people. Um, I mean, it was, it was Thomas Dolby, you know, the guy who wrote, she blinded me with science. Yes. And if you're an audio nerd, you probably know who he is because he's invented so many amazing things. Um, Homer Hickam, who wrote Rocket Boys, which became October Sky, he was there. Um, I had Space Gal, you know, uh, Emily? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, also, there was a storm chaser, Reed Temmer was there, and a former astronaut, and we just had this wild group of people that had done a speaker series, and we were all hanging out closer to last call than I'd like to admit, <laughs> and Homer Hickam's like, you know, we're trading all these travel stories, like, you should write a book. It's like, no! I don't want to do that. <laughs> He's like, that's what you do. Like, writing is really hard. Every time I do a blog, I agonize until the last minute, and it's constantly being written in my head, and then it's just, it's stressful, and then I write it, and I'm happy, but that happiness is so short-lived because it's just all at the end because I got it done, and it's never perfect enough, and he's like, no, just write a book. You've got mm. all these stories. You've got so many stories. Write a book. And I said, no. And he basically double-dog dared me. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, fine, fine, fine. You can let your agent call me. So his agent called me and said, ah, Homer tells me that you're going to write a book. I was like, no. <laughs> Nothing counts at that time in the morning. <laughs> I'm not writing a book. And then I just kind of let it sit. And I was talking to my daughter about something that she had going on at school, something that she was afraid of. And I was looking at her saying the words, OK, honey, bravery it's, it's not what superheroes have. It's not having mm -hmm. superpowers. It's being scared to death and doing it anyways. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, and I walked out of the room and went, damn it, I gotta write a book now. <laughs> so I, I called back the agent and was like, how do you do this? What do I do? And he walked me through this. You, you gotta write a book proposal. So I wrote a horrible book proposal that was like 90 pages long. And I took it to some publishers. And I didn't get the reception that I was hoping mm -hmm. for, so I pulled it back. And I actually hired someone to help me with the book proposal. It's like, like a writer that's actually good at this. And I was like, how do I make this something that people actually want to buy? And so she cut it to pieces and you know, brought mm -hmm. it down to like 30 pages instead of 90, which is insane. And uh, I went back to a bunch of publishers and got a whole bunch of different offers. So it's really just the presentation. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. this is actually kind of cool. Like writing a book is hard, but the learning process is amazing. And it has all of the things that I've always preached to my daughter. You know, don't be scared, make opportunities, you know, learn from failure. So the, the first going out with the book was somewhat of a failure. Learn from it, called an expert, very mythbustery. <laughs> <laughs> went back out with it, got a bunch of offers, and then all of a sudden went, oh, now I gotta do it for reals. Ugh. So I spent a lot of time stress eating and drinking wine during the day in my living room. Maybe I sh should be more of a role model about that, but that's, that was <laughs> just my process. 
Um, I took a bunch of stories from journals. I had a bunch of stories written on my computer already that I had written down along the way. I had videos from all of these years at Mythbusters. And you know, I talked to all my friends. I'm still friends with a lot of the gang. So I'd be like, hey, remember that time? And then I'd be like, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. I'm like, are you, are you taking notes? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I put together um, a lot. Uh, I had never realized how collaborative a book process is as well. Mm -hmm. You've got a designer that tells you your, your pictures are good or bad or the wrong size. You've got two, three editors that keep coming back at you with new versions of the book that take entire chapters out to say things like, Nobody wants to read about your childhood. I was like, what? Okay, that's gone. <laughs> more embarrassing stories. Could you give us more embarrassing stories? I'm like, oh, yes, okay. So, you know, finally, after I think it takes about a year or so before I had the end result, and I'd already spent the advance, so I put out my version of Mortified for everyone. There's a lot of stories that are very. Um, I, I make myself very vulnerable. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely talk about a lot of things that I don't think people expected. It's not a science book for kids. It really is my personal memoir. And you know, I always liked memoirs. And I, I never liked them about people who were clean and had it all figured out. I like messy people who learned mm -hmm. along the way. So that's my book. And bu building on that, uh, you know, I wasn't sure what to expect because I got this galley copy. I knew it was a book, and it was about you. And that's all I knew going in. And uh, I was really surprised, you just touched on this, that it was so raw and personal. It wasn't the pristine social network fantasy that represents nobody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag it <was> Instagram. The <laughs> yes, it was kind of a real version of Carrie Byron. So what was it like sharing so many aspects of your private life? And did you draw the line anywhere? Where, was, where did you decide to draw the line? I mean, I, I put a lot of private stuff in there and it wasn't until after I turned it into the editors and that I realized that oh my god my dad and mom are gonna read this and I told the story of losing my virginity I want to puke right now but I already spent the advance so <laughs> it's too late now. I think that's gonna be a theme of this talk. Pretty much. <laughs> Go. <laughs> yeah. So you also narrated the audiobook you can't do a book now pretty much without doing an audiobook was that um, fun tedious painful all the above? It was somewhat excruciating for a couple reasons. One, I'm, I've never liked the sound of my own voice. I don't think anybody does, mm -hmm. but that's a long period of time to listen to your own voice. Also, when I read the whole thing out loud, <laughs> I wanted to change stuff because I had done it so silently for so long that the, the audiobook version is actually slightly different than the finished process of the actual book. Mm -hmm. So the more polished version is in words. So if you want to... I prefer you read it than listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> there are a couple things I'm like, that doesn't sound like me. Why did I write that way? It's no, changed. So I want to do a little show and tell now. We give uh, <laughs> editing time for, let's see. So there's a lot of really cool artwork in the book. And I uh, want to have That's Carrie. very kind of you. They're, yes. they're more like sketches that mostly were in my journal that I just traced. All right. <laughs> well, there, I'm not, I can't go through all these, but I will kind of just talk about this is, says, love is the smile that smiles back. All Can right. I give you a little secret? That yes. Originally, th that was for something. I, I took it out of a journal. It originally said, you die alone, so you might as well be happy with yourself. But they didn't <laughs> like that, so I changed it. <laughs> <laughs> I changed it to fit the chapter. Yeah, that's. Um, <laughs> Inside I, information, I've never told that story. That's <laughs> why you have editors. That's a good choice. <laughs> now, uh, going the other end of the spectrum, this is um, a, a weapon that you could use to attack a zombie. <laughs> I do go through. This is part of my my zombie apocalypse mm -hmm. kit. I do really have this in my house. It has a roll of duct tape. It has a machete because for some reason over Christmas um, a couple years ago, two different people gave me machetes. I don't know what that says about <laughs> me. But I got two machetes one Christmas, so I've got one in my zombie apocalypse kit that, I mean, everybody has that, right? And then a bottle of unopened champagne because at the end of the world, I want to be able to savor a bottle, drink the champagne, and I have two weapons. Very sharp <laughs> bottle for a good eye socket gouge and a machete because machete. So I'm a zombie fan myself. Now I've had many debates in prior c companies about zombie attacks. So would you, uh, this is not one of the questions I wrote, but I want to ask it now, is uh, where, uh, where would you rather be in a zombie apocalypse? Would you rather be in a basement would you rather be in a deserted island? Would you rather be on a boat? Or would you rather be in your apartment? Jamie's workshop. 
Jamie's <laughs> workshop. That would be a good place to be. All right, I'm going to choose one, uh, one more. Uh, let's see. Oh, I like, I like this one. All right, because I think it's a good theme for the book. The harder I work, the luckier I get. And I think that there's uh, a lot of threads in the book that, that tie back to this concept. So what does that mean to you, that statement? Well, I, I know it's, uh, you know, a, like a Thomas Jefferson quote, but I saw it at the back of a tattoo parlor. <laughs> 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 and it was just about this scrappy guy that just made his way, uh, even though he had some physical disabilities. And I was like, yes, that guy's successful because he worked very, very hard. And for me, I've, I've never necessarily had it easy. I mean, yes, I am a white suburban girl, so I, I haven't had it too hard, but I've, I've always worked very hard for my opportunities from getting my job at Mythbusters. Like, I worked for free and busted my ass to stay in that job, and I've always worked very hard, and it's created opportunities. The reason mm -hmm. I'm sitting here now is because I keep pushing myself as much as I can to do weird and wild things, and it's um, generally beyond the scope of what I'm comfortable with. I'm constantly making myself un uncomfortable to get to the places I want to be. Cool. Um, so I love the premise of the book, uh, that the scientific method can be applied to life, not just <laughs> science and engineering problems. And I thought that was a really cool kind of hook for the book. So how do you define the scientific method? But more importantly, how did that concept become the unifying theme of the book? Well, I, I needed a good way to tell the story that was very cohesive of a lot of strange, different pieces of my life. And very early on in Mythbusters, we realized that the perfect narrative vehicle for busting a myth and telling a story in the allotted amount of time that we had was to use the scientific method. And that was sort of the, star, the story arc for all of our myths. And, uh, you know, the scientific method is really just a tool in critical thinking. And so you can apply that to any decision that you have to make because it's all really about creating an experiment, bleh, slurring, creating an experiment and then analyzing it and finding the conclusions that are going to help you learn. So whether you fail or if things turn out well, it's all about going through that process. Mm -hmm. So you devote an entire chapter to money among many other topics. Um, you weren't born with a silver spoon to carry you at all. And people may not assume that given your success. You really hustled to pay the bills. You worked multiple jobs, nights as a sampler uh, for liquor brands, arbitraging, uh, secondhand clothing via thrift shops. You know, what did you learn from those days of hustling to pay the bills that helps you out today? I mean, the hustle is hard when you're young. And I, I really did learn that there's always a way as long as you keep looking for it. Like, I really did enjoy... San Francisco, I, I, I'm sure a lot of you remember, used to be just this real thrifty haven. And you used to be able to go out to the rich suburbs and buy, you'd look around for the like designer shoes and be like, oh, those are Ferragamo, yes, $2. Thank you, charity run by nuns. I'm going to go to San Francisco <laughs> and sell these for 20 at the thrift store on hate. And I used to make a huge living, well, huge. I, w I paid the rent with, <laughs> with that. But you know, I, I think that I, I just learned that there's always a hustle somewhere and you just have to kind of think outside the box, which you guys do well here. <laughs> I think everybody probably has the hustle here. I like that, having the hustle. Uh, you also touch on love, and I won't get into losing virginity stories, um, <laughs> awkward. Uh, but you also share this really <laughs> touching anecdote about your husband and fellow artist Paul giving you the gift of 365 love letters, one for each day of the year. Woo, that raises the bar. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, celebrities seem to struggle with relationships. What has given your relationship staying power despite celebrity? And I'm sure a lot, and you write about imperfections along the way. You know, I, I just, uh, I'm an accidental celebrity. I'm not mm. really, a, mm. I, I'm not somebody who sought out this life in any way. And I live in San Francisco. You know, we don't have a big celebrity culture. And I met my husband before all of this nonsense. And he's always been a big support to me. And I'm a big support to him. And I honestly think that, uh, I fell in love with the person that felt like a chemical reaction rather than an analog. <laughs> like mm -hmm. he didn't check the right boxes, but he just felt right. So for me, it was more about biology than it was say, I'm, I think tender and all that's an amazing thing for filtering, but I think it's the real human contact that's gonna keep you together. Yeah, and kind of uh, that human contact, um, you know, you, mean, you meet a lot of people in your, in your role. Uh, and they know you through your media persona. And you write, uh, interestingly, about sometimes feeling lonely when around lots of people. 
and that you don't mind being alone necessarily, and you write about amazing experiences you've had with complete strangers. You know, what have you learned about friendship when so many people assume or want to be your friend? Well, I mean, I, I feel like you have different places that you have different people that you need. You might have that one friend that you bicycle with and that one friend that you get everything you need from for a day and you may ne not ever see them again. So I, I, when I'm traveling a lot, I've got that, you know, I'm not famous enough for somebody to be like, pointing me out on the street. I, I can go to a bar and still hang out with a stranger and sometimes I meet the most amazing people just while I'm on the road and having one-on-one -on -one conversations and I never tell them what I do for a living. I kind of skirt around it and then I can have a friendship for a minute. Cool. All right, I want to do a little bit more show and tell because there's so many cool things back here. <laughs> All right, so this is where editing comes in. So tell me. But isn't it live streamed? This is, oh, the live stream, they can see all the unedited, but the, the YouTube, in your brain. Is gonna, YouTube is gonna get the edited version. All right, so tell me a little bit about this interesting piece of art. So <laughs> let me see how that's. So I have grown a uh, passion for black powder over the years, and it's not just the explosive nature of it. I always liked sort of the detritus it left behind, and I always noticed that after we do explosions, I would go kind of check out the mayhem that it left behind, and there was a beautiful artisticness to the chaos. So I, I have, um, I, I will use black powder in paintings. I will fence it off in some way. I always thought round things always just look like planets to me, and I try to control the chaos as much as possible, but you can't replicate it twice the same way. So I explode black powder of different grains, and then I paint within it to try to make these sort of spacey-like themes, and. Interior designers seem to like them. I've been, <laughs> I, I either sell them at art auctions or you know for charity, or uh, this one's going into somebody's home, I believe. Do you have a do you have challenges at TSA if you go get on a flight right after you've done black powder artwork? I'll <laughs> tell you what, I have gone <laughs> straight from the bomb range through TSA several <laughs> times with it just all over me, exploded ordnance, and didn't get like tagged at all, but. Y you make fun of the TSA once on social media, <laughs> and Tori and I are completely separate parts of the, the, you know, the lines, and both of us got the serious pat down. <laughs> Apparently, they found explosives on my phone. I mean, it's been years, and they, they, I, I got, I, I think they're, they're, I'm on a watch list now, so <laughs> I think. All right, so now you actually talked about some of these last time, and you graciously agreed to bring, let's see if this, I'll hold this up for the, so describe uh, what this little fella is and where he okay. or, or it came to be. So there, there's, there's two kinds of parenting. There's the good parenting and then there's the creative parenting. I'm the kind of mom that like when my kid isn't brushing her teeth, I'll show her pictures of like meth teeth and be like, eh? You wanna be like this? I'll be like, cause this will happen to you. She hasn't figured it out yet. And she hasn't Googled. So uh, these little characters are uh, a series of creative parenting that I, I touch on in the book where my child and I, um, we work through her disgusting habits, and all children have so many that there's a lot of material there by uh, creating these monsters that are supposed to be mommy's manners monsters. These are lessons. So this guy is the uh, nail biting monster. Um, it's attracted to the smell of freshly chewed nail beds, and when you fall asleep at night, if you've chewed your nails, it will come in and finish them off. <laughs> <laughs> These are the booger monsters, which they live in your nose, and if you go up there, pick your nose, and you steal their food, they're gonna get hungry and go into the next available hole, which might be your ear, and it'll go into your brain, and it will eat that, and then you won't learn to read. <laughs> <laughs> and just one, uh, one, one more. So this is a uh, pretty macabre, and kind of, uh, I think you put this out on social media, but um, describe what this is all about. I just do a lot of tiny little sculptures. I live in San Francisco, and everything has to be tiny and compact there. So <laughs> I work uh, very, very often in this size or much, much smaller, but. Um, this one was somewhere around the time of contract negotiations, I believe, <laughs> <laughs> where I was being told to be part of the machine. So I, I do a lot of sculptures that just are how I work out my feelings at night is better in a little studio than, say, getting very angry and putting out <laughs> blogs. I, <laughs> I make them personal. <laughs> well, also, yes, by doing that, that angry email that you send in a few seconds. It's a little hard to do the angry sculpture. You have a little more time to, re to reflect and refine and decide, yeah, yeah. I make better decisions yes. that way than Facebook <laughs> my angst. <laughs> so you write about in your book about having an artsy punk aesthetic, uh, about redefining yourself as a rebel. How important is style and is that how important is that to, 
for young people to think about? I mean, it was really important to me when I was young. It was, I, I mean, when I started Mythbusters, I had so many piercings that just, it, it, it all sort of kind of fell away the older I got. But I, I think that it's important to be respectful for the right places that you're going to. Like, you know, you're, you're definitely not going to wear your booby shirt at grandma's. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that uh, it definitely is something when you're young, it's, it's a really interesting process of how you're trying to define yourself and the people that you are around. Cool. Uh, so you, there's a couple areas of the book that get pretty serious, and I want to touch on a couple of those because I think it's valuable for other people going through similar things. Uh, you write about that you like the control of sobriety, and that said, you write openly about alcohol, both as a liquor brand ambassador and going through what you'd call a saturated period. You know, what was your trigger to change your relationship with alcohol? I mean, mostly it was having a job that I really cared about. You can't really show up with a hangover when you work with power tools. Um, <laughs> though, you know, it's an Australian production company. We had a very healthy relationship with the end of the day. And, uh, <laughs> you know, alcohol. Like, it, it slowly became more interesting to me to not overdo it. I, I, um, I have depression, and so I found that in my youth I self-medicated a lot with mm -hmm. alcohol. And uh, it's something that I see a lot of kids do because they don't understand they're depressed. They think that they just have problems with the world that they're in. And, you know, uh, I, I think a lot of kids start drinking very young and very heavily to fix that. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of wanted to put it out there that that's what I was doing and the mistakes that I made so that maybe, maybe you figure out that you're going through de hormonal depressions rather than ending up an alcoholic because you're trying to fix something that isn't actually a problem that's external, it's internal. I mean, that's a perfect lead into an area that I thought was the most powerful in the book was where you talk openly about, uh, you know, wrestling with depression for many years. And uh, it, it is not something people would probably assume from this media persona that inevitably follows you around. So how did you become aware that you had something called depression? I mean, it really was when I was, I started on Mythbusters and I had my, I had this dream job and I had a husband, uh, well, he was my boyfriend at the time, but I, I had this man that I was in love with. I had a great apartment. I had everything and there was nothing wrong and I couldn't assign blame to anything. And I was like, oh my God, this, this is, this feels chemical. This is something that I can't control. And so that's when I started to address it in that way. And that's how I figured out how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But uh, the reason that I put it in the book is because I had met a woman on the road, um, that a young a woman, she was in college, and she was saying, I get depression, and how do you make it through when you're trying to achieve these goals, but you're weighed down? And mm -hmm. I, you know, I started to tell her I had the same thing, and I could see it in her eyes that it was almost like relief to her that this person that she saw on TV that she thought was always happy and always had it together had the same thing that she had, mm -hmm. and she, it, it seemed to you know, it, it touched her and she told me later, she's like, that really helped me. When, and I'm like, okay, well, if I can do that, I mean, I might as well put it in the book. What have I got to lose? I can help somebody possibly with it. And you, you tried everything. You tried all kinds of different strategies, medicinal strategies, toughing it out strategies, everything in between. What have, and, and, and different things will work for different people. What has helped you manage depression, even though it's probably always going to be with you for the rest of your life? Scientific method. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I did a lot of experimenting, and I mean, for me personally, being somebody who likes the dark, arty side, I, medicating didn't work for me. I found mm -hmm. the side effects horrendous. I found it very difficult, and I tried and tried in different ways, and I, I honestly find, you know, I go completely sober, I, I exercise like a like a crazy person for the endorphins, I eat super duper healthy, and I don't I, I know that it's going to pass, which mm -hmm. is now that I know what it is, I know it's going to go away. It's made it a lot easier. I also put myself in social situations with other people. I, I find that it actually really helps to not lock myself away and, and hide it. Well, thanks for sharing that so openly in the book, because there's other people that will probably never would have assumed that, and it will make a difference. So just a couple more questions before I open it up to the Dory and the folks in the room. Um, it's so funny, you actually read the book. A lot of people that interview me, they, oh they just ask Mythbuster questions the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I actually read the book. I read the book on a, on a, on a flight to, to Nashville, actually, and uh, it is a perfect four-hour round-trip length flight book. Oh, fantastic. So I'm that, going to that Dear airport bookstores, yes. <laughs> James Moorhead says. Exactly, exactly. Yes. 
So um, Mythbusters was an amazing contribution to reality television, and it was really sad when the show inevitably came to an end. You dedicate an entire chapter to setbacks, including how Mythbusters ended. What have you learned from those setbacks that help you going forward? I mean, I, I thought that the world was ending for a minute when I left Mythbusters, because that had been my first you know, it was, it was such a huge job. It was, it was over a decade long, and it was everything I knew, and it was everything that I'd put in all my passion and heart into for so long that I was suddenly completely unqualified to do anything else <laughs> because nobody needs you to drive a forklift and, you know, blow things up in regular jobs. <laughs> I was terrified. I went to the mall. I bought a pair of theory slacks. I was about to get my LinkedIn <laughs> all ready. I'm just like, okay, I don't know what this is. I, there's just no boxes for what I do. I have no idea. So, you know, being able to kind of gather myself from that and go, okay, what do I like to do? What do I want to do? Okay, I like this TV thing. Maybe I can do this TV thing. I'm going to keep going. So I actually just started going out and pitching shows on my own and letting people know that I'm still here and I'm ready to work on other things. And other shows started showing up. They're like, oh, Mythbusters is over? Come over here. Mm -hmm. yeah, travel Channel's like, we would love you. Come come do science on roller coasters. And it, it, was, it was a good lesson that life continues beyond even when the wonderful things end. So uh, that's why I've, I've continued on with TV and I'm moving into new fun fields myself now. Yeah, so that's a perfect lead in to my last question because it's mm -hmm. uh, your next gig. Um, you've recently joined a cool startup, Smart Girls. Is there Ooh, I have one. Yes, got I a do new have show one. and tell. This is our last show and tell. Okay, so you, um, you, I'm looking forward to understanding uh, more about the cool startup smart girls that you recently joined as their chief creative officer uh, that's creating self-balancing programmable robots targeting girls uh, with action dolls. What will your role be and how did you get connected to this opportunity? And you should <laughs> definitely show this. It's really cool. Let's see. Can I show it on the floor? Should Let's I try to see. show it up here? Let's see. I think probably up here. All right. Let's move these little movies. guys over. Yeah. So I did not invent this. I. Uh, so it's like a little segue. I don't want her to drop off. <gasps> Give her some room. Yeah. Hold on. Okay, because she's trying to learn to self-balance, so. And uh, almost, yeah. Well, if she jumps off the edge, it'll be more like me. Well, that'll okay. be a, that will be a Mythbusters <laughs> moment. So there you go. She's got her little segue. She does that to self-balance. So I, I, when, um, oh, so oh, that's her. Cool. I'll do that for you. <laughs> I thought to myself, what do I want to do besides TV? Because I like TV, but I, I'm, it started, you know, it's, it's, it's feast or famine. It's a little like, you know, s sooner or later I want to do something new. And I always wanted to do toys. And that's next on my bucket list is I want to work in toys. So I just started getting on the Google <laughs> <laughs> and researching places that did it and how they did it and what they did. And I, I uh, talked to everybody I knew um, about connections and um, just a friend had talked to a guy who was involved in this company. I cold called him and asked him out to coffee to, to pick his brain. And by the end, he's like, wow, you might be, this is kind of your brand. I mean, this is a STEM for girls brand. So this is a doll on a self-balancing robot that is completely codable. And it teaches block coding to girls using their tablet or their phone so that the doll can uh, move through challenges. It can dance. Music comes out of it. But it speaks to the way girls play, that mm -hmm. which is uh, they do a lot more storytelling. And um, I, I feel like at one point, the whole revolution was, OK, we got to teach girls STEM. So don't make anything pink, because that's, that's too girly. And STEM doesn't have to be girly. And I feel like now that the revolution against the revolution is, or the girls that like pink, let's also teach them coding and computer science. Let's make toys for everyone. And this, this is supposed to reach girls at the age that they stop being interested in coding and computer science because all the toys start getting very masculine. They're robots and they're cars and they're things that destroy. Whereas my daughter, who's in love with Minecraft and loves coding, is now one of only two girls in her entire after school program because every year they dropped off, they dropped off, they dropped off because she likes to code in ways that 
creates stories and she makes these big castles that all have a reason for everything and then the boys in the class go in and blow it up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, they're both really good. It's just, I think that sometimes we need to make it easier for girls to continue on in this field. So um, this is just the launch toy. This is the one that it was seen on Shark Tank and that's where they got their start. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, they won out of like 40,000 companies and they've got such a great hustle going on that I met the founder and I was just like, yeah, I would like to join with you guys. I'm going to help them in their next round of seed funding so that we can actually start making more. And then I've got a bunch of new coding toys that are <laughs> that will probably be coming out by Christmas. Awesome. That is so cool. So um, we are now going to shift to audience and Dory questions. But before I do, I have two copies of the book. I learned, uh, as I mentioned before, there's the galley copy, the one that I actually read with all you the You didn't tell them what notes. that means. Galley copy, well, I didn't know what it meant, so I Googled it. So galley copy is a, uh, a pre-release copy of the book, not entirely finished. There, I, I, I someday will read the released copy to see what the differences are. How significant are the differences? I and mean, they're not significant, but to me they were. They were important changes to me. They're very small. So the, uh, <laughs> the book is fantastic. Strongly recommend you pop out your smartphone right now and order up a copy. And I see there are copies already in the audience. Uh, it just Yay, came out. Thank you. And uh, it's just a really good read. It's a very unexpected. So with that, um, uh, we will get a my assistant, who's an engineer with our team, to get the microphone. All right. Uh, thanks for coming in. The book, I haven't quite finished it yet, but it's great. It reads like so, it's so easy and interesting. I really appreciated, uh, and you touched on it a little bit already, that you were very honest about dealing with depression and how it was hard on Paul also. I'm wondering if you have any advice for people who find themselves in Paul's place who want to help but don't know how to do so. It's really tough when you're married to somebody who does have depression, and I, I, I think that in any family it's very difficult because you want you, you take it very personally. You're like when that person is sad or angry, it's always going to feel like it's at you. I think that the most important thing is to just remember it's not you, and you also have to just take care of yourself. You know, the the, the partner of someone who's depressed has to really understand that it's it's not something that they caused, and. Um, just be as understanding as possible, but I think it's also the depressed person has to, as well, be very understanding that that, that situation is something that is going to happen and that you have to take extra care of each other. Great question. Thank you. All right, next, take another one from the room. Here we go. So sort of a two-part question. Um, we become who we are from our experiences. So would you say that everything you've gone through in your life has been necessary or would present day you go back in time and try to change something that you did in the past? That was uh, something somebody asked me and I put some of it in the book. Uh, present day me would go back and invest in Google. <laughs> <laughs> I would have stocks in all of that. <laughs> that would be amazing. But uh, yeah, I mean it definitely took a lot of uh, tripping and falling and I don't think that I would be here or be as happy as I am with my life now if I hadn't had all of these scary, awful experiences or wonderful experiences. So, um, I, you know, I wouldn't say I don't regret anything. I just say I've definitely learned a lot. So from the, from the Dory, somewhere out on the live stream. So what's this, uh, you probably get this question quite a bit. What's the myth you most want to have revisited because you think it has to be true but was busted on the show? That has to be has true. Has to be true. It was busted on the show, but it just didn't feel like it should have been busted. Uh, I don't know. I kind of agreed with most of our results, except for <laughs> Fireworks Man. I was really, I, I, I uh, Fireworks Man, we, we launched a guy with fireworks, and I, I feel like the producers wanted it to not be real, so um, they came up with a different conclusion that I came up with, but in the end, it was the group ruled against me, so... I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't want to actually retest that one because it was kind of ridiculous. <laughs> um, <laughs> in fact, I, most of them, I, I'm pretty satisfied with how they came out in the end. Yeah. I think you made a big difference around the, uh, the cell phone at the gas station. Yes. I, I love that myth. I thought that had a very positive impact on gas stations that used to put a sticker, no cell phone, near the gas, even though it's totally absurd. I would no. like people to stop firing bullets into the air when they're celebrating, because we know that they come down. Like, that was uh, another one that I thought was very good, that we actually had some you know, statistical research happen <laughs> from the show. 
Also, the one that I would really, really like people to believe is the uh, airport lines when you are boarding a plane, yeah. where it doesn't matter what the zones you are. If everybody just boards and does it efficiently, the, the most efficient people will generally get to the front of the line, and they'll do everything quickly. And then the slacker people, which somehow always end up in first class, just like, oh, wait, let me put my dog here. And I, and <laughs> they're always in the front, and I think it'd be so much faster if we just let nature take its course. <laughs> Or, or you know, <laughs> I feel very strongly. I fly a lot. Every time you fly, you should have like you should be timed, and then your next flight is adjusted based on how you performed the last time, yes. and then that will sort it all out <laughs> yes. over time. And the people who don't mind, they don't mind taking a long time. They'll be at the end, and they don't yeah. care. Yeah. So we got other from the uh, from the audience. Here we go. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So I. I admit I haven't read the book yet, but it seems you've done a lot of traveling in your time, and I was wondering what the biggest piece of advice you have for someone who will be spending some time in an unfamiliar place. Um, it depends on con in different countries. Um, if you're in Egypt, you didn't drop anything, no matter how many people say, hey, you dropped yeah. something. <laughs> Don't stop and turn around. You didn't <laughs> drop anything, I would say would be my best piece of advice. But no, I, <laughs> <laughs> I think sometimes you got to not look at the travel blogs and just just let it go and explore because I think that's the most interesting part of traveling is just stumbling into things. Like it's great to kind of have a, an idea of where you're going, but I generally like, uh, you know, even in the United States, like we do a lot of filming in places like Philadelphia, for example. I, I knew that I had six hours before I had to be anywhere. So I looked for the best <laughs> vegan cheesesteak I could find and it was miles away. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna walk there, no matter what neighborhood I have to walk through. And along the way, I found so many cool things, like art mm -hmm. galleries and weirdo people and just like oddities shops. And you know, the Mütter Museum was on the way, which is uh, the uh, Medical Oddities Museum. Oh, so I, I found cool. so much craziness along the way just to get to the vegan cheesesteak. And it was the journey, not the reward. It was delicious, by the way. But <laughs> So I, I had this whole entire adventure because instead of like, okay, I can sit in this hotel room for six hours, I made some sort of just arbitrary destination and just let my feet take me into the weird. So we'll take one more from the Dory and one more from the audience. So um, I'm sure you get asked this a lot too. The you had a chance to do Mythbusters again, would you? Or is that kind of part of your life, kind of had a wonderful bookends and, you know, that, that's that? I don't know, because Mythbusters can't be Mythbusters again, because yeah. I've learned a bunch from Mythbusters. And the whole amazing thing of the journey is, is that I had no idea what I was doing <laughs> at all from the beginning. Like, everybody thought Mythbusters was a science show. It wasn't a science show. None of us have a science background. We all were just experiencing it together and learning together. And I almost feel like uh, at this point I might be, t t I, I don't know if I would have the same giant reactions to things because I kind of know when stuff's going to blow up now. <laughs> so I'm not sure if I could do it again. Cool. So who wants to be our last question? Hand raise it. Or down here. No pressure. You're the last question. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mean to fixate on Mythbusters, but um, it's okay. That was a, that's the whole reason that I'm here. <laughs> so, uh, Jamie and Adam have been pretty open about the sort of chemistry or lack thereof. Um, at Google, we have we talk a lot about cultural fit when we talk about a candidate, um, but it se sort of seems that you know their lack of chemistry has actually produced something really great that lasted you know for as long as it did. Do you think it's actually more important for a successful project to have? good team chemistry or to have that clash of personalities that the two, I guess, hosts had? Well, you can have a clash of personality, but you still have to have a respect for each other and what you bring to the table. When that's gone, it's over. Like, I, I, my team with Tori and Grant and I, we had amazing chemistry. And so the three of us had uh, the same, you know, a, fun mythbustery results than you know Jamie and Adam that had the, the clash but I think that the the common thread is that we all respected each other's skill set and what mm -hmm. we brought to the table and appreciated the diversity because I, I really do think that diversity is the best way to solve any problem cool and uh, you know we still all hang out <laughs> I still torture Tori all the time we still prank each other a lot that's kind of my dream is to have a prank show 
<laughs> What's your favorite uh, prank? If you could choose just one, you talk about some of this in the book, the pranks. And but uh, I mean, on MythBusters, we did a lot of different pranks. But uh, Tori and I, at one point, trying to create a prank show, it didn't get bought. But uh, we <laughs> we actually perpetrated an amazing prank on some unknowing people that thought they were on a reality show. Uh, we uh, <laughs> we brought them in to watch the price pr the process of cryogenics and um, told them that it was all real, and then had the uh, cryogenically frozen people turn into zombies and attack them. And it was <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> and I am dying to put it onto the YouTube at some point, secretly. Maybe somebody will leak it. Yeah, if YouTube and Sam Bruno's <laughs> watching. So, cool. But that was, that was the funnest I ever, I ever perpetrated myself on a grand scheme. But uh, other than that, Tori's made me vomit a lot by drinking things that I thought were bodily fluids that were actually just like, he switched it with some special effects. Like all of a sudden he's drinking an entire beaker of old saliva and I'm throwing up on the floor, <laughs> but it <laughs> turns out it was just tea and he's a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, I think it's appropriate that we kind of end with a Tory story, so. Uh, <laughs> okay, <with the> what <laughs> you got? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're in there. Darn. So, so um, I want to thank you for coming back to Google a second time, trekking up from the, or down from the city. And uh, everyone, Crash Desk Girl, a fantastic book. You're going to learn something from it. It's very personal. It's emotional. It's not what you expect. And uh, highly recommended. And I actually read the book. Um, so hopefully your other, your other book tour interviews, you get a, a mix of people who have read the book. Um, <laughs> so I want to thank you again for coming back to Google. It's been a pleasure having you here. Well, thanks for inviting me. Yeah. I love it here. <laughs>